All right, welcome to Shop Night Live here in Canterbury, New Hampshire. I hope you're having a good night. We've had a beautiful, glorious day here today. It's been almost like uh, it's a late fall day, but it didn't feel like winter, so we were happy. Some sun was in outside. But today I was here, and if you saw any of our posts about this, I'm in the middle of shooting a fine woodworking article, which is a lot of fun. It's a surprisingly pleasant experience, and I'll tell you more about that in just a second. I just wanted to catch up. I, I'm sure some of you are very concerned for my organization project, and as I shared my attic and my messy drawers last time, uh, just in a quick update with that. I'm seeing counselor now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I actually feel really good about it. Like uh, my my um, my prognosis, sort of. I, I feel really good about the future and being organized. And I've I've done some very unusual things this past weekend. I, I actually like got excited and I was cleaning the garage on um, Sunday afternoon. You know, before the football game. I. I can't even, it was shocking. I mean, I had everything out of there. I was sweeping it up. I don't know what's going on. But I did want to fill you in on my progress. Um, I really haven't done anything <laughs> on the shop. No, I actually have. <clears throat> and I want to thank Ron, Ron Bart. Thank you for that nice email. A number of you have sent me very nice emails, um, some commiserating with the same uh, malady that I have, but Ron obviously is one of those those organized people that uh, has that gene, and um, he was very thoughtful in uh, what he said about uh, systems for getting organized, like not trying to just take one piece and put it in an orderly place, but actually just get things in general groupings. Get them all in groupings. Um, this, was, this was, by the way, I forget your exact job, Ron, but it had to do with uh, sorting programs way back, I think you said 40 years ago. I don't know, you're not, you're not that old. But, uh, but they had to come up with the sorting programs with comu computers, what was the most efficient way to sort things. It turns out to put things in general groupings and then you go from there and break it down. Now that might sound obvious to you organized people, but it's not to like the general person. Of course, uh, the camera lady was thinking along the same lines because I, as I shared with Ron, she said, you need to get some boxes. That was my first step. You need to get some boxes. And what she meant by that was, you just gotta start putting things in boxes and grouping them in like categories, general categories. So we have boxes. And look at this. I already filled one box with general. Uh, these were some of those bed parts that I had on the bench the other day. I've got finials. I've got bolts. I've got little patterns. But everything in here is related to beds and poster beds. So that's a start. I actually have three or four other boxes out there with hardware and things like that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to get everything out of the drawers. I mean everything that I can find at the house, like not, not in the house. Uh, I mean my tools um, and everything I can find and just categorize it in general categories and then break it down a little more and get rid of the things I don't need. And I'm going to be ruthless, Ron, I hope. <laughs> and then once you have it boiled down, then you find a place for everything. Like the shakers said, what did they say? <laughs> a place for everything and everything in its place. So I really, that was gotta... Benjamin Franklin. What? Didn't you say that was Benjamin Franklin who said that or something? Oh, maybe it was Benjamin Franklin. I forget. But yeah, it was a, I think I did. A... I've looked at so many quotes for the shakers. Because once again, we're doing that shaker presentation on Saturday if you want to show up at the Curry Museum in Manchester. The 
great, great. But anyway, thought. that's enough for the organization thing. Let's get back to the fine woodworking article. I just want to tell you that one of the great blessings in my life in the last uh, couple, three years has been getting to know the people at Fine Woodworking. And, um, you know, I've always loved the magazine. It was actually in the mid-late 80s that I, I first discovered Fine Woodworking magazine. I think it was 86, 87. And I couldn't believe it because I was like, what? People are actually doing this for a living? Because I had it in me. I knew I loved that creative thing. And I had done it younger days, gone to trade school. And then I had gone in another higher education path, you know, getting a math degree, actually going to seminary and getting a degree at seminary. But I never really got that thing. But when I saw Five Woodworking Magazine, I can still remember the, the cover. Uh, we were joking. There was a guy, like, putting the base on a table. But uh, it just lit a light in me, like, wow, that, it rekindled my my thought, and that actually triggered my whole uh, thinking to go into woodworking full time. And so, of course, I've devoured lots of fine woodworking magazines over the years. Pug Moore and I shared a lot. I have the whole series. He gave me a lot of his, so a lot of the ones I have, I have his stamp on it. And so it's just really kind of surreal now, you know, almost 35 years later, to be doing articles with them and um, just to be part of that history. It's such a great chronicle of, of really some great makers over the years. And um, so it's what, it's what an honor, you know, it makes you feel like, wow, um, I used to respect that magazine until they put me on the cover, <laughs> but if they only knew. So anyway, uh, it's just a thrill. And the way the process goes is you get an idea for a project um, and you have to be someone who's been in the, in the craft for a while and submit an idea. If they like it, then you can go, go with it there. But because I did the show and I got to, they saw a lot of stuff, it's like one thing has beget another project. So the... Um, we were doing the finishing project um, that was the most recent magazine of the Craftsman style finish. And they really liked that chair. So they said, would you do an article on that chair? So that's what we're doing. So it goes from the, we, sub, we plan a date for the outline. And then, so I get a rough outline. Here's the way it's going to go. And then we plan, then I, they have another date a few weeks later for the manuscript to be due. And um, after we've talked a little bit about the outline. And uh, once the manuscript is in, and we hash out any fine points about that, um, they and their team work on a photo list. Like, what's the best way to tell this story of making this piece? What are the shots we really need? So you get a shot list. And then you arrange the day, they come up to your shop, and you get all those shots. So right now we've, we're, I don't have the list with me, but Barry, Barry Dima is the photographer on their team who's doing this shot, shoot, and he's excellent. I really like working with Barry. He's, um, he's not been there a long time, but he's been there long enough. He's very hardworking, diligent, and what I really like about him is he gets, he knows what he wants and he gets the shot and he says, got it. And we seem to move right along fairly quickly. I try to be ready with as many parts and pieces, but we're over halfway through. So this is a two day shoot. So um, I haven't done that many two day ones, I don't think. What am I saying? I haven't done that many. I haven't done that many at all. <laughs> I think this is my first two-day shoot, right? Anyway, with fine woodworking, anyway. So um, anyway, it's a real pleasure. And then they, after they get all the shots, then it's just a few weeks might go by, and you get the proof of the article. 
So they work on it as a team. They go over the manuscript. They got John Benson's in there. He's the guy who uh, writes and does the back cover. But he's one of the editors that he's really a fine writer. And Mike Pekovich is in there too. He's a great writer. He handles the art direction. He lays out all the photos so it looks pleasing. So your magazine, like when you get it, it has been so thought out, like how to tell the story in different ways. Like you can just read the pictures and that gives you certain um, detail about it. And then you can read the text and that they don't really go into the dimensions and things in the text. It's more um, the flow of the, high, the important points on the piece. So it's been a lot of fun. And, and you know, the, the part of the writing that's really interesting is, to me, is the first portion. Because that's really when you can say something that grabs you or um, feeds into why you'd want to build this piece, you know, why it's meaningful or, or an interesting project. And then you get into the nuts and bolts of making the piece. So um, this project, I start off by just saying something that Pug Moore told me his father used to like to say in the shop, that um, if you can build a chair, you can build anything. And that's really, it's kind of true in a lot of ways, you know, and because a chair has so many angles, it's, it's challenging, like just dimensionally to get everything right. You have to view it from three dimensions. Um, and as Jerry Osgood used to say, some people are going to just fling their, themselves onto it. It's like the only piece of furniture, other than like a bed, but a chair, people are going to abuse it in some ways, you know, but it, it has to accept the human frame, the weight, but also be designed for comfort. So you've got all those things working about, and it's, so it represents a really, the ultimate challenge in woodworking, I think, in some ways. There are, of course, some very ex extreme things you can do with case pieces and all that. But if you really push a chair, you can veneer a chair, you can carve a chair, you can do all kinds of things, but it still has to be comfortable. So it's one of my favorite things to make and design. So it's been uh, great fun. Now this chair that we're doing for this article is a, an arts and crafts inspired chair. So I actually designed it for the show and I took a bit of a hybrid off of a, a chair that I made from uh, Thomas Jefferson's collection at Monticello, just the back leg. I kind of borrowed some of that. It's not exactly though, it has a little different lean. So it has that period flare, but it also has very linear lines. So the great part of this chair is that it's a wonderful introduction to chair making. It's a mortise and tenon chair, and it, it's just a really honest bones of a chair. Uh, here it is right here, if you haven't seen it before. Some of you have seen this on the website, um, or you saw the episode on... Um, what's now classic woodworking. This is an unfinished one, and this is the finished chair. This is the one that we actually highlighted and was featured in the article on the cover of Fine Woodworking showing that finish, that nice um, craftsman style warm finish. And that's with shellac and glazing stains. And that's, that's it, you know, it's, oh, in stain, regular stains as well. But see how it's got these lines very straight. So these are 90 degrees going in here, but you've got a curved crest rail. On the back, we have a curved cut underneath what's called the shoe. This is the splat that you lean against, the, the back leg or post. Look at it, we even got pegged mortise and tenons in there. It's just an honest chair that has a lot of integrity. These lower support rails here are called stretchers, and they add strength to this chair because now this construction or web of pieces, this joint now is reinforced by having a secondary joint down here. 
So any strain you put, like if you lean back in this chair, like I was always told not to when I was a kid, instead of all the strain being on one joint, you're reinforced with a secondary kind of frame down there. So you get quite a lot of strength with that second stretcher. Now, a lot of period chairs had another stretcher that would go across here, or sometimes right across the front, but I, I've done a couple chairs like that, but I really dislike those because when you sit in them and you want to sweep your feet back, you hit that rail. So that's why they're usually set about a third of the way back and come across like that. Now this chair, I just didn't want that horizontal line. I just like the way everything looks vertical from the front because we've got this craftsman look. So I just wanted to have more verticality here. And it really isn't necessary. I threw in an extra glue block right in this corner. If uh, anyone had any concerns about the strength of this joint, like because this leg doesn't have the stretcher or this stretcher to keep it from squeezing in. But man, you just got, you've got a pegged mortise and tenon with a glue block backing that corner up. It's a super tough, very strong joint. And this is all white oak. It's like a timber frame, a miniature timber frame house, but shaped like a chair. <laughs> so it's been fun. We're going through the process of building this chair. And this will be featured in the magazine. It won't be out for probably three months. It's not the, the uh, next issue. There's one coming out any day, but it's the next one after that. So um, anyway, this is a little more advanced chair, but built with the very same principles. And remember when we were up in the attic? Last time I showed you these arms that I dug out, and I said, oh, those were sentimental to me because Pug had these off to the side of the shop. This is the chair. And this was in his shop like while I was working there. And uh, he, he gave it to me and thought I would finish it out someday. But I kind of like it, you know, just, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I should finish it. But all this is nicely sculpted. And he carved these knuckles. But see how the knuckles relate to, this is called, this is the crest rail the crest, like the top of the chair. And this is the ear of a Chippendale design. Like Chippendale chairs are recognizable by this crest rail. Quite often it has this flaring out um, part at the top of the leg, which is called the ear of the chair. Um, and then the splat will have cut through cutouts or piercing detail. Um, so rather than saying, hey, look at that cool chair with the cutouts, if you want to sound like you're in a museum, a, a curator, you say, that's wonderfully pierced, that Chippendale Philadelphia chair. So <laughs> this, this layout is actually was popularized in Philadelphia. So this has a nice shell on the front and straight square legs. And instead of a seat, that sits on top of the rails, which I kind of tried to simplify on this chair. This has a frame that sits inside a recess, or a rabbit, they call it, so that after you oppose to this frame, it goes down into that rabbit, and it just goes in with pressure. And it's captured by that lip, and it gives you a really clean look. But you can just pop it right out, or slip it right out, so it's called a slip seat method of, of upholstering a chair like this. So it's pretty cool. You just, you can do the whole finish like that. And, you know, you either upholster your own seats, which I don't, but I would like to uh, play around with that a little bit. I usually have an upholster to do it. And then just set it right in and you're done after it's finished. So these arms... These, the ends of the arms, it's very typical for those to mirror in some way the ears of the chair. So here we have these three lobes and this beautiful carved volute kind of curl, curly cue under. And that is matched by the ear. Look at how those little balls like 
knuckles curl under. And those aren't quite sanded, which I like. It's still faceted from Pug's chiseling. And anyway, this has to be brought in. And um, these arms are just roughly cut, but they sit on the rails like this. And this bracket here, that has to be fitted. So you have to do a little scribing. And, but isn't that cool? I mean, I remember sitting, you know, one of the great lessons early on when I realized the subtleties of great design was Pug, we were making some chairs and I, I had all the side chairs, but I had an armchair. And typically the armchairs, we'd always build them one inch deeper and an inch and three quarters wider on the front rail and an inch and three quarters wider on the crest. And that was so that when you put the arms on, it wouldn't be too narrow for the wider among us, right? If you put arms on a narrow chair like this, it, it's a little tight, you know? You can't really feel comfortable in it. So with the wider chair, this is almost 20 two inches wide across the front, it might be. It, it accommodates for the arms. Anyway, we had one like this and we're looking at it and we had sawn out and marked up an arm and stuck it on the chair like that. And I'm standing back and Pug looks at it and he goes, he just goes, oh, I think we can take a little more right off here. And he takes his finger like, <laughs> he takes it like a, uh, a square or a stop, um, he uses his, his middle finger like a stop and he drags his pencil and he scribes about an eighth of an inch off of like the outer area or something to take some of the weight off of it. And I was looking pretty much, not I was next to him, but it was like you're getting to look over the shoulder of uh, an artist, you know, going, I think I'll put a little brush stroke right there. So it didn't feel right, the composition wasn't right because that arm had too much weight or maybe it wasn't curvy linear enough to relate to the crest rail or all of this going on. But look at how beautifully the curve of this arm relates to the curve of the crest rail and then you have the knuckles rolling over and it's not too heavy. This is fairly light, it gets nice and slim in here and then flares out and this would always be sculpted in, so if you rested your arm up on there, it'd be super smooth and comfortable. But you can put out your hands and actually, when your arms are resting back, just roll right around that knuckle. And it's just good to feel that, you know, where a craftsman's hands have been. So this is a sweet memory of a chair, but much more complex than building this chair. But this is an awesome place to begin because you get the fundamentals and you go, okay, I get it. And then you can add to that on the next one. Because this one, this one tapers back like this, but the back is also flaring. So like this is this side rail, for instance, is plumb to the floor right here. But as it comes back, it's actually appears to be twisted. That's actually planed out, but the tenon on the back is actually twisted into the leg. So it's a little more to talk about than now, but um, this will all be kind of featured in this next article, the approach to, to chair making. So we're going to rely some on a drawing, a full-size drawing, and um, which I've got right on this table right here. We've already got a picture of it uh, for the article, but this is uh, looking down on the chair and if you've never built or heard about building chairs the one of the best tools you can use to start is to have a full-size drawing you can visualize it you can draw out all the relationships and you can measure full-length pieces right off the drawing so here for a chair you also want to look at it from three different vantage points the profile view is where we get this cool leg shape that allows you to recline and you can see the height of the seat which tends to be right around 17 and a half inches high with a cushion give or take that'll put you at the right height to sit at the
the common height dining table, which is usually right around 30 or slightly under. Then look at, this is the, the seat. We have that trapezoidal seat. It's 20 across here. It's 16 across here. And once you have that drawn out, you can use your bevel gauge and index right off the front of your, your board and align that. See that, how it nicely aligns with that side rail? That's the seat angle. So this is the angle that you cut that shoulder and you've got to angle that tenon going back in there. But this is all you need. You don't even have to know what it is, what, what degrees it is. This bevel gauge is set and you can go directly to the table saw and lay your saw blade over and go for it. So that's what we're covering in the article. You know, I find doing photo articles really enjoyable because you get prepped but there's not as much stress. It's really kind of a, a comfortable day to shoot, especially if you have somebody good to work with, like Barry, because it's like, you know, <laughs> it, when you're shooting video, you're really trying to get ready. You're hoping words come out right. You know, you get one shot at it. But, um, or you get second takes, you know, if you're doing um, a recorded type thing. But, with a photographic thing, it's sort of like lights, action, stand still. <laughs> You're like, okay, okay, right there, stand still. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty easy. <laughs> All right, now, stand still. <laughs> so you're doing what you're doing, but I am actually building a lot of the elements of the chair. So it is, a, it is an engaging kind of process, and the day just flies by. But um, the secret of great photography too is taking a lot of shots so you know you just hear the camera firing off and these lights up here with the umbrella you know it's pretty lean equipment he's got a couple umbrellas like that which he's always moving around trying to get that light just right we have a an eight foot step ladder over here that we bring in because you may notice like in fine woodworking just take a look next time. Like sometimes you're seeing a view that's much more above the bench. It's because Barry or John or Nisa, whoever's doing the article, is up on a ladder or a platform getting a vantage point that you just take for granted when you're looking at it. But it's, there's a lot of artistry in the perspective that they're offering as well in the article. So. This is what we did today. We just made this jig. We added this, so that's going to be featured in the article too. Using the template pattern, this is the, the leg pattern for that chair, you can um, make a jig like this that will cut the exact profile of this pattern in inch and five-eighths thick white oak. So you bandsaw it out heavy, you set up the jig, you make your first cut over here and bring it over and get your second cut here. And you, you gotta just set it up with the stops. But if I buckle that down with these hold downs, it's perfectly flush with that edge. And that back edge was, was flush routed right against the pattern. So the end result is an identical match to your pattern. So making a jig like this, I don't really do it if I have one or two. In fact, we never used them at Pugs. Everything was just bands on and then hand shaped, hand planed and spoke shaved and planing the flat surfaces and the long shot. And you actually, it was pretty, it was a fairly fast process, but if you laid them all down on top of each other, they were subtly different. And sometimes the angle might be subtly different. But when you went to clamp it up, because they're far apart, it's a little bit forgiving. Your joinery has to be pretty good. But chairs can be a little forgiving uh, fitting the joinery. But uh, boy, this is a great, efficient, kind of accurate time saver if you're building a set of chairs. Like imagine you're doing eight chairs around a dining table. You want to tackle that project. That's a challenge but you 
could make 16 legs very close to each other very accurately by just taking you know, maybe an hour to build a jig like this once you get it all ready and things like that. Now, I did flesh route this with a new bit right over here. You can check this out. If you took one of my other classes, I think we were, we were talking about this. This is on the router table. The um, Infinity Tools sent this router bit. This is an awesome bit. I mean, I, they never had these, this type when I was using routers. It was, you're, you had like a choice. If you wanted to, to flush route something, this is two inches high between these bearings. And it's got a flush cut bearing on the bottom and the top. And there's a shearing kind of helical cut you get here and here. So it's a beautiful bit. It's about $130, I think, from uh, Infinity Tools. But I'm not, they're not sponsoring this or anything. They did um, give this bit for the, the, the thing because I, I asked them. <laughs> and... Uh, it got um, worked out. Anyway, um, I'm thrilled to have it because I did hear about it, and it's a wonderful cutting tool. But it does soup up your router table to do some serious sh clean shaping. But make sure you, you got to make sure you have a strong enough router underneath. But that's what we use to flush route the, um, to the pattern to make those legs. So it worked out awesome. <laughs> so, um, the rest of this chair, just want to show you how, what we're doing. I got a little more prep I got to do in the morning, but um, this is the, this is the material we sawed out the two legs from. It's some nice, nice white oak. Let's set this over here. And these are... These are a couple legs that I'm going to swap out <laughs> to assemble the chair tomorrow when we assemble and clamp it up. Um, it's nice to have other parts you can swap out so you, can, you don't have to actually do all the work. You can actually shoot the photos in, in the allotted time frame. So this one, you notice at the top, we're going to have to show a few pictures of making this little pyramid detail. And that's, you see that on some um, craftsman style pieces. It's kind of a signature element of that period. And this one, all I do is I draw a line, I index down from the top and draw a quarter inch, a line a quarter inch down from the top all around. Then I draw a line across the center and I bandsaw heavy to the line. See, then I I make that line and that line. So I, I'm basically shaping it like a roof. You know, just a regular, is that called a gambrel roof? I, no, it's not. Uh, this is just a regular pitched roof, a flat pitch roof. So you get that center line. Let me put it in the vise and I'll show you how easy this is. And since it's tapered, I have to put a little tapered stick here just to get it into the vise. And, all right, it won't clamp it very well. Okay, so there's my roof. Now, this was just bandsaw and heavy to the line. Hip roof. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> you hipster. I knew somebody would know. So I'm going to use this low angle block plane to just come up from the bottom and just take little swipes at it. And it's on end grain, so a low angle plane is perfect for this. That noise, it sounds like I'm calling turkeys. <laughs> but no one showed up yet. So. So now I got my roof. I'm down almost to the quarter inch line, and I'm looking to see. I'm just about reaching the center line, so I'm ready to come to the other side. And I'll go ahead and pick. What's that?
what's great about this, I'm not only shaping it, but I'm polishing. I'm getting some beautiful, clear grain so that bandsaw is disappearing. And I'm almost down to the line. And that's about it. Okay, so I'm just about, you don't have to get it perfectly to a point, but I can just see the line now, and we're down to the line. Now, once you've got it to that hip roof, now I just want to find the center point going this way. So this should be right around an inch. Let's see what it is. Yeah, it's just a slightly over. I'm just going to mark the center like that. And now I just have to make guidelines connecting each corner right to the center. So I'll go like that. And then I'll lay this on here. No, same thing. No, no, this is just a fun little part of this project. This is covered in depth in the, I have a video on actually making this chair and uh, full-size drawings, but um, this is pretty simple. But just, a, you're basically making an X but you're going up the slope, connecting the corner to the center point. And this, they act as guidelines after you get going. So I've already created these two sides with the hip roof, but now I have to taper. I just have to bring these two down to create the pyramid. So I gotta take all this material off. Now this, this plane I usually leave set a little heavier. So this will take material off quick, more quickly, and then, and it's just a good old Stanley, nothing fancy. And then I can go to the Lee Nielsen, which is set more finely, and brings in the turkeys. No offense, anybody. I'm not talking about you. Um, I'm going to lay this down. And I see I can see that facet now just approaching the line. So you take a few swipes, check it out. And I want to get down to that quarter inch line. I'm not quite down there. So that's pretty close right there. That looks good. And then I'll come back on the other side. Kind of shearing. Coming up with the grain. And it's kind of, it feels better to have it right in front of me like this. Doing it from that side, I didn't feel as controlled. Now I've roughed it down, get the fine one. Just about there. That feels good. All right, so when I get it down to that, I just get a block. And I'm just going to take, I've got 220. That almost feels too aggressive for this. I'm going to start with 320 if this, isn't, if this is too fine for it. I just want to kind of polish this up. I have a question while you're doing that. Yeah. And I think you may have mentioned this, but just to be clear, Stuart's asking, did you have the first plane set to a deeper cut than the second plane? Yeah, I do. I, that's the point of it. I didn't want to readjust my Lee Nielsen. This is just set heavier all the time. So if I want to chamfer a, an edge really quickly, I'll just grab this one. And it's, it's not as nice, but it actually, I keep it fairly sharp so it's ready to go. And then the Lee Nielsen, typically I'm making finer cuts with that. So yeah, it's nice. To, I just like having two 
set differently so you don't have to stop and keep going back and forth and planing out the blade and all that. Oh man, look at that. So that's really sweet and polished. I'll just break those edges around the sides a little bit. I'll soften those corners a little. So people's hands are going to probably go on here and it's going to get burnished. But that's that's the way That's the way I shape the pyramid. So there you go. Little pyramid shape on the top of that. Just a quarter inch down from the top. Everything is shaped right around. Can you see it against my shirt? Okay, so I need to do that anyway before I could do this final assembly. I'm just going to assemble the back and show you how this goes together. So we've got, I got to do some more sanding, but this will be the one that I'll assemble and we'll either we'll really glue it up or we'll, we'll mock glue it up for the article tomorrow. So I'm going to go like that, and that, and these, these are just the splat pieces. So the interior has to be assembled first. So those are all set and these are reclining at the splat angle, which is a little different from that seat angle I just showed. And then I just flip it upside down and we go right in to the crest rail this way and I can just see what's going on and align them and get that to fall in. So all the glue would be in there and then we'd get a clamp on there. I like to put like an angled block on the bottom so that it wants to clamp a little more aligned with the spine of the splat pieces. If not, if you put a lot of pressure, it wants to open this joint up in front if you just go flat on that angle. But by coming up a little bit, putting a, an angle block, it applies pressure a little better along the spine of the splat. So once, now you can glue this up in stages. You can get the glue in there and then just get the clamp on it and just dry fit it in here. Or you can go for it all at once if you have somebody to help you. But I just like to relax a little bit more. And if I have a set of chairs, I'll just do all of the splats sections first. And then by the time I get them all glued up, I can come back around, pop the clamps off, and actually get glue in the side rails like that. And then we have a lower stretcher here that's the same length, shoulder to shoulder, as those pieces. Goes right in there. And then again, we work down into the table. It's a lot easier to see and handle this thing. get the glue on there and we would clamp it up and there you have the back of a craftsman chair pretty sweet huh just very basic and I there's something about simplicity that is appealing you know just it's easier it just feels honest you know there's nothing too crazy about it like the shakers, not liking their, uh, I'm going to have to change that one. Oh, no, that'll work. So this will be clamped. That's what's good. You've got to really get these shoulders all tight. You know, never want a gap in those. So by clamping that first and getting that set, but letting it, letting it set up while it's dry fitted in the side rails actually keeps it aligned. So you don't like torque it out of position. So then once it's all dry, you can knock it apart. Now you just have the whole splat and you just have those four tenons and the lower stretcher to worry about getting glue in and clamping up this way. So it's much more reasonable to do it in stages. But that's it. That's the back of this 
craftsman style chair. So we'll have that done tomorrow. And I've got to make these side rails first thing in the morning before Barry gets here. And we will uh, actually demonstrate that on for the article. I think that's what I wanted to cover. What would you call a difficulty rating on that chair, hon? <coughs> um, I don't know. I mean, it depends what the scale is. The difficulty rating on this chair, uh, I would say there's a good place to begin mortise and tenon chairs because there's nothing, there's not really any big curveballs. It's kind of interesting to learn how to shape the pattern, um, how to shape this curved back leg. And this is a really nice one. But the back of this chair has all 90 degree angles here. These are all 90 and they're all the same length. So they're all just kind of captured, just like we just did there between that piece. And then you just have these angles here. So this is on the lower end of difficulty, you know, a mortise and tenon chair. It's really a great, I think it's a great one to begin. And it's, it's really comfortable. This upholstered seat this has like two inch medium density uh, foam in there, but it's got webbing, cotton batting. You could do it traditionally if you wanted to get into that. I know I saw a video, I think it's Rick Mess Maselli, somebody on the Fine Woodworking website. There's a video of upholstering chairs like this. Ah, but it feels good to sit down after this day. So that's all I got. Does anybody got any other questions? <laughs> Uh, the, uh, ironically, the guys are asking, or Dean asked about the lighting, if it's something I'm noticing. I don't think we have extra lights on, Dean, actually. Oh. No, no. we're not using Barry's lights. Um, Is it too bright? We didn't change No, he was, I think he was saying that it's helping. And oh, I yeah. Well, this light has sometimes been off. It's a little, yeah. it's a little moody. Sometimes we would like more light, but. Um, on and off when it wants to. We aren't using Barry's lights tonight, but. No. So, um, but if you're interested in chairs, you know, this article will be out. We also have, um, like I said, check out on our, on our uh, website. We've got the plans already if you wanted to, if you didn't want to wait. And we've, you've got the um, videos of making this chair as well. But it's a nice supplement to the fine woodworking thing as well. So 10 hours of Tom teaching you step by step <coughs> how to make this chair. Yeah, so we really go into a lot of the subtleties, you know, and um, all those details. So it's a great, it's a great piece. I, I really like chairs for that reason, just the comfort and the the challenge, but the, the potential for the artistry of it. So. Is this LED lighting that we have up here? No. No, it's uh, fluorescent. Uh, it's fluorescent. But I would like to go to LED. It would be, um, it's a little cheaper and. Someday. Yeah, who knows? You don't get the buzzing. Like I've had to turn some of these lights off because the ballasts are shot and it would be there is a little bit going on now, but not like it was. So, Any other questions? Nope, I don't have any more. I, well, I have a question from Stuart, and I'm not sure what he's asking. He's asking you when, and I'm not sure what that means. If you want to fill that in, Stuart, quickly. Um, oh, Bob says, Tom's clear making class was the best class I ever participated in. Oh, thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. It's always awesome to have you here. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that was... I think it's inspiring to build a chair because it's, it is, like I said, it's something people sit down in, you know? There's not many pieces you make where you tell someone, try it out, you know, but you mean, see how it feels underneath you, you know, like you might try out pulling it over a drawer, but it's not the same. So it's a great opportunity. Like I like putting curved back supports in, like the Adirondack chair that was a different kind of low rider that I was playing around with there, but 
Um, dining chairs, you know, everybody needs them. And there's such a variety. You can, you can make reclining type chairs or rocking chairs, which are great to start at because if you only need to make one and no one's going to say, where's the rest of them, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just make one, get a taste for it. Hey, we also have that. We have a craftsman style rocking chair. If you want to make one, and uh, we got that up on the website too, but mm. that's a cool <laughs> chair to start. Very cool. Super comfortable, and it replaces your recliner. I've had guys who made them say, that's the chair I sit in every night. And I watch, you know, I'll watch TV or whatever. I don't sit in a recliner anymore. It's so comfortable. It's got a nice curved lower lumbar, and... You know, you lean your head back. If you have to take a little snooze, you're all set. <laughs> uh, Dan is asking, what degree for the back do you usually design into dining chairs? Um, it's, it's hard to say. It does vary somewhat. It depends if you have. I don't think of the degrees, but I checked on this one. I've used so many patterns from old chairs and then others. I actually laid this one back um, a little more, but it, you know what it ends up being? It ends up being about, this one's about 11 degrees, you know, so um, right around there, 10, 12, whatever, for a dining chair, you know, you don't want it to recline super big, but it's interesting how, how laid back you are in like a, a reclining type chair or a rocking chair, you know, they sit like that. Another thing that makes a chair more comfortable is the seat not being horizontal to the floor, but the front actually being higher than the back. So if the seat is dropping as it goes to the back, now I didn't include that on this chair because I was trying to keep it simple, but a lot of the ways I do that is I'll still go with all the angles here, but I'll make the front leg just longer so it, you, don't, you don't really want to put all these, like a parallelogram here. It's overkill. You, no one ever notices or cares that the leg is slightly angular to the floor. Especially you can cut a, uh, sometimes they're shaped and you can never even see it. But having that little upward uh, tilt to the seat, it actually gives you a more positive feeling like you're really sitting in the seat. So I've had other chairs that were more vertical. The leg is actually more vertical. But because they reclined, I mean, because the seat, the front leg was a little longer, the recline angle ends up being about the same as this, like after you sit in it, you know. So this is a, because of the upholstery on this one, though, it's, it's really nice. It, you don't feel like you're slipping forward at all. It still feels like you're sitting nicely in it. It has a good recline back. Some of the very formal period chairs were even more vertical than this. I haven't, I haven't even compared it to this one. But see that? That chip and nail chair is a little more upright. If you can see the lines. It's a little more vertical. But the formal chairs, you'd sit up straighter. Like this one allows you to just sit back after that turkey dinner. This one, you have to like slouch a lot, <laughs> a big slouch. <laughs> so anyway, are there any other questions? Uh, do you prefer, uh, Michael's asking, do you prefer white oak or red oak for chairs? Oh, Michael, that's a good question. Uh, white oak is really the preferred material for craftsman style dining chairs. It's it just got a better color. It's like a wheat colored wood um, where red has that pale. But the other big difference is um, it's an open grain wood like the red oak, but the red oak is very airy. Um, it's really pronounced open grain. And the uh, white oak actually has like clogs in the pore structure. So it's not as it's even though it's an open grain it's got a more dense texture to it in fact so much so that water does not wick up through white oak so it's actually a good exterior wood 
I have, I used it for the thresholds in the shop here and in the house. I built outdoor swings out of it. Um, it, it weathers really nicely. But you put red oak outside, because it's so, it's like really open straws as the structure goes, it just wicks water and, and it rots very quickly. But the main thing is the texture, the color, the density is just a little better than the red oak. So, um, and it's the classic choice for the craftsman period. So if you're going to reproduce a craftsman chair, you really want to go with white oak. Uh, no, no. Um, actually, you the uh, the the real preference of the craftsman period was what's called riff sawn, which you may already know is is slight, cutting slightly to an angle of the board so that you don't see the flecking as much. Um, but you can. So you can buy quarter sawn, which I just bought. Did I buy a quarter? I resawed some. I don't know where I put those legs. I'm going to do show the rails tomorrow. Oh, there they are, right behind you. So this is a good example. I'll grab this. Hold on. So if you look at the end grain here, you can see that that grain on both of these pieces is not dead perpendicular. Now quarter sawn, anything that's about 30 degrees to 90 degrees to the surface where the growth rings are running perpendicular is considered quarter sawn. But anything 30 to 60, which these fall into, is considered rift. So once you get in that 30 or you get to 60, the flecking or the medullary rays disappear off of the face. So and you get more of this combed kind of grain. It's like this combed, almost like, I always think of it like wheat, you know, with the color. It's a beautiful kind of golden color. And look at this side. So you get that really nice linear texture of the grain. And that's what they, they sought after, the really finer craftsman um, makers. They were, they were choosing the best riffs on they could find so that the medullary rays, which are strong flecking, were not disturbing visually to the linear component of the uh, design, of the composition. So it's just a choice. So I go with the rift if I can. If there's some quarter on there, I don't care. But you know what happens when you're when you're doing your back legs, you're buying a wide plank like this, and this is flat sawn, so you've got the growth rings running kind of parallel with the surface. So once you saw your legs out, which you saw out on edge like this, so look at this leg. You can see, see that, that right there? That's a lot like the center of this board. This is the plain sawn area. So you saw out your legs out of inch and five eighths stock like this. You could get three legs out of a board like this. But then when you turn it up, what you're seeing here is quarter to, to uh, rift. Quartered and rift. So you're seeing some medullary rays right there, but it's really nice and combed. So yes, your plain sawn on the side, but where you see the chair right from the front, you're going to get it there. So I don't fuss about that. I, I know I'm going to get a nice look. Like, look at this chair. That nice kind of comb texture right here. And then the splat, I do try to get rift here. You wouldn't want plain sawn. You're trying to get as much linear grain. It accentuates the linear uh, nature or design elements of this style. So that's what you're going for. Hope that answers your question. There's got, a, lot, a got, lot to think about. Got there. some other questions here. Does, does white oak chip like red oak? Yeah, it can be problematic. Um, white oak, because it's not really porous all the way through like red oak, it's very difficult to dry. 
So uh, sometimes it just takes longer. And some dry kilns, they might go too fast with it. And what happens is the exterior gets dry first. And they call it case hardening. And then the interior is kind of soft. And sometimes you get like these cracks or honeycombs in there. And sometimes when it's dried weird like that, it actually does chip or flack a little more than you'd want. This is really nice stock. There's nothing wrong with this. This is Highland Hardwood stock. Really nice select white oak. So um, I usually don't have that much problem with it. It tends to be how the wood was dried if it chips a lot. But look at, we just ran this leg, shaped it on that spiral flush trim, what do they call it? The mega flush trim bit, the infinity router bit. And because of that spiral, even though it was cutting into the grain up here, there's no chip out. And then here where it's more severe, the grain is coming out that curve at that angle. You want to plan your jig so that it's cutting with the grain in the more severe angular area of that leg. So I always position it so that like the cutter is spinning. Like if I'm cutting this side, I want it spinning this way so it's not trying to lift that grain off because it would just blow off that end. But having that spiral helical head just softens the cutting angle of the cutting edge and you get much less and really no chip out on this at all. If one cannot find clear oak, what wood would you suggest for a chair like this? Clear oak? That's what he wrote. I'm oh, OK. Sure. If you can't find uh, clear oak, um, if you go to a hardwood dealer, they, they would have it. It's what they put in the bins. Typically, you don't see knots. You're going to mainly look out for sapwood like that. So I could get around that with the curvature of here. But, so I got some nice legs right in there, but it's kind of wasteful. Or you can hide that maybe on the inside of the shoe, something like that. So, but um, I like this chair in cherry as well. I've, I've made this in other chairs. This just feels like a nice chair because cherry has that nice even texture. And uh, in fact, in the class, the last class that Bob was talking about, we made all our chairs in cherry. It was a little little more contemporary. We did a few little spins on this chair, but it was very similar. OK. Uh, Linda Liu is asking if you cut your mortises by hand or use a machine. <laughs> oh, good question. I've cut a handful of mortises by hand. <laughs> I don't. It's really one of those interior joints that it's so time consuming, it's not worth it with the kind of machinery that's out there that you can get to cut. So I have a mortiser hollow chisel mortiser that I use to cut most all the mortises. Um, there are other types of machines out there to cut mortises. There's horizontal, horizontal mortising, which I always think of this wrong, like a horizontal mortiser. It's basically like a high speed router, horizontal, and you have a table, and it plunges and it cuts a very quick slot, but it has rounded ends. One of the things I like about the hollow chisel is it cuts with a nice clean square end, very much like a hand cut joint. But I mean, if I'm, in a, if I'm stuck in a carpentry job and I'm, or I'm doing a door, something you can't bring to a mortiser, yeah, I'll, I'll mortise it. But it's fun to do a few to appreciate the hollow chisel mortiser. Because <laughs> it basically does a beautiful job. You can also use a router to plunge. You can use floating tenons like the new um, Domino, not new anymore, but floating tenon cutters are also a good way to get around cutting these. But you can get a bench top hollow chisel mortiser for around 300 bucks. So, you know, you save a lot of time that way. Or you can get the floor model like I have. Um, I think they're around 1,000 now. But also on Craigslist and Marketplace on. Mm -hmm. You, um, was that Facebook? Yeah. You can find tools all the time. Yeah, a couple more. Um, Michael's suggesting maybe a future in a SNL idea uh, maybe to walk through your approach to doing layouts for furniture. 
layouts for sorry. Lay, layouts on furniture doing how you s set out I'm sorry, I saying I this understand. wrong let me read it to walk through your approach to doing layouts for furniture lay designs or probably, layout, probably. Or layouts for joinery yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe joinery or just a design we do go through on this article we took a number of photos just showing laying out the joinery um, accurately and efficiently so that's included in this article as well but yeah anytime I I love doing that like talking about design um, and the layout of marking oh by the way in the next fine woodworking which is due out very soon um, I did a little article on um, on marking tools uh, and so that's going to be in there and I show my little it's I was almost I was like uh, this isn't really that great but it turned out to be a really good article um, okay do you ever use live oak for furniture it's in, used in boats a lot it says live oak live oak you know I've heard of it I don't uh, you'd have to explain what that is um, you mean Oh, you mean, um, do you mean it's not kiln dried and so that it bends more easily? Yeah, Lars, if you can give us a little more descriptive there so he can answer that. Um, or is that a particular type of oak? I'm not familiar with uh, maybe a species. Yeah, I don't know. It says he, they use it in boats. but Yeah, um, I've heard of it. Stuart, you're know. asking about floating tenons versus cut tenons, which is stronger. I think that you would find it really helpful to watch Tom's whole piece on the tenons. Um, oh yeah, one I did, night, uh, did all about tenons. It's one of those live streams, the one where I have the right the floating tenons in my mouth. Yeah, all about tenons. It's you know, an episode. Yeah, the 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 true tenon is is going to be stronger because it's integral. It's it's a part of one piece so like this tenon this is a true tenon it's an extension of the actual piece a floating tenon you're just cutting everything exactly to length and then you're boring a hole or a slot in one and a hole in a slot in the other then you take a loose tenon or a, the floating tenon that's sized appropriate you glue it in to both sides so you're getting a glue a glue connection into both sides now it's it tends to be very strong along the line of the grain, so it'd be stronger running into a piece like this. But where it goes in cross grain, you know, it's not. But still, that's it's still not as strong as this wood is integral to the piece. So a, a true tenon is a little stronger. But you know what? If you set it up right and think about it, a floating tenon is plenty strong for most applications. You could build chairs like this with floating tenons, and they would last a good long time, especially if they were well. So we have a lot of input on the live oak con. Um, oh, good. It is, uh, yes, Stuart, it's on YouTube. Look at the episodes, past episodes of Saturday, uh, Saturday, Shop Night Live. Live oak is southern oak, Lars says. Oh, okay. West Coast, uh, let's see, live oak is an evergreen oak, very common in the south, complex grain structure made uh, it great for ribs on boats. Huh. Holds foliage all year round. Oh, interesting. That's that's interesting. I don't I don't know. I've never used it. It's not like something that we find like commercially available up here. It's a species they pretty much boil it down to things that are more commonly known around here, I guess. So that'd be interesting to try out sometime. My cabinet doors actually when I was in North Carolina, we had a big oak tree was behind Pugmore's shop and it was massive and I asked the guy to save me a chunk and he and he did and uh, I had it sawn up to boards and this is actually I veneered it so it was some kind of oak and I didn't know what it was I don't think it kept its leaves all year round but it was a really a rich color this is just oil there's no color on that so I love it I love it because it's from its yard, but it does have a pretty cool texture, but I'm not sure that it's live oak. I just, I knew some kind of oak. It was like a southern oak I wasn't real familiar with, but 
That's interesting. I'm going to check that out. Thanks for that tip. Yeah. yeah. If anybody else is interested in that Tenon uh, video, I'll put the, the link in the description to this video so you can look at that. Yeah, I think that's all I have. Um, all right. Well, thank you all for being part of this. Thanks for spending some time with me in the shop tonight. I really enjoyed sharing my experience with the article and a little bit about chairs. But I hope you'll come back. Next week we'll get into maybe a project. Um, haven't decided yet. <laughs> but I'll let you know, and I'll see you next time right here on Shop Night Live.